You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Welcome to the Welding Podcast, where today we begin a fifth series with my guest, Sandra Blatterer, who is a Berlin-based visual artist and lighting designer. Today we're talking about imaginary spaces, installations, visual concepts, and performances in context. Thanks so much for chatting with us, Sandra. Hello, Renee. Thanks for having me here. I've been following your work for over five years, as you work a lot with space and light for contemporary dance. And I was especially moved by your work in City Lights, a continuous gathering, which was a project initiated by Maria Francesca Scaroni and Meg Stewart that took place at Hebel am Ufer, affectionately known as How for Berliners. And it was a really moving work as the performers were very much in the space with the audience and the audience was moving freely around the room. And I remember at one part in the show, these large fluorescent bars of light that were placed on the floor slowly were lifted up into the rig and so they really came in line with the eyes of the audience and the performers and then continued upwards very high above our heads and it was such a poignant moment for me because I really felt the agency within the lights and Yeah, it really struck me, actually, that piece was in 2016. So I've been following you ever since. And it's really wonderful to have you on the program just to talk a little bit about the agency in lighting and how you're working with that art form. Yeah, it seems really far, far away. So all these memories are are kind of blurry because it was a really intense uh, time. There's a lot of input there and and learning and connecting. So it felt a bit like being in a time capsule and we are navigating through a universe which we don't know in this project. And the day and night time generally didn't matter anymore for me. So these two weeks of, of being together could have also been like two years for me, for my feeling. So I think we all had multiple realities of the same event. For example, you observed these flying light bars and I observed something else in that moment. And City Lights was um, a beautiful continuous gathering based on collaborations between artists here in Berlin. We all came out of different fields, as, for example, as visual arts and performance literature film and also experimental music and it was not a completed performance it was more kind of a platform for experimentation and uh, playful interaction for us i do remember that a week before we opened the doors at how that we organized small workshops for each other There was, for example, a very lovely studio session, I remember, with the artist Mieko Suzuki on the turntables. So she tried really to learn us how to DJ. And I also remember uh, a living room situation at uh, Julia Bolucci's place. She's a costume designer and provided a really wide range of costume variations. So her home at that evening was filled with colorful clothes and items and photographs she also had like a wall full of photographs images what like a a mind map i remember yeah to visualize what she imagined for us and the space and i still see us all in between that chaos which we created there and dancing in it so this was a really playful way and also a pleasurable time These mini sessions helped us also to get to know each other better and and to connect, of course, and also to understand our materials and and the personal ways of working with these materials. One of 
a very important task for me in the process of City Lights was to find out what was hidden in the actual performance space, also in the theater, and making really use of everything what's there and everything what's possible and transform it over these four days. So we discovered, for example, small private spaces, which we later on used for one-to-one sessions, for example. We found like these narrow corridors in the building and also new ways to enter it and exits, back doors, also staircases and a garden in the backyard. And yeah, so much more. The list was really endless. And we tried to study the whole entire space and every corner of it and its possibilities and secrets. They really had that impression that I was embraced and in the action that all the artists that were present from all these different mediums, as you spoke to, were very present. And that was really beautiful to see. It really seemed to me like a meeting of multiple worlds in the space. And this this moment with the light bars going up, it's interesting that you talk about looking also at the equipment within the theatre, because this is quite an old technique, I think, having these cables that lift things through the fly rig. It's very much this almost proscenium arch feeling of the, you know, backdrop coming down and the next backdrop arriving. And so I loved that, that the use of what was present in the space was really embraced and became something new with this very kind of modern lighting household fluorescent bar being lifted up. It was very much a meeting of two places. Yeah, the installation with the flight bars, which you have seen, in the ceiling was like one of my discoveries there in the house, Mm -hmm. which I made during the excursions at the Haowan building. I mean, we are talking about a flexible steel construction, but with flexible, I mean, it can just move up and down. You're right. It's a very analog old system and it's normally used for theater spotlights or the set design on a fixed position. So I tried to think of how we could use the system or machinery in a different way for us. And yeah, therefore, I work together with the technicians, the team of the house, and we attach these fluorescent tube lights, which are also dinosaurs. (laughs) And we attach them to these five very long steel pipes, um, which we placed next to each other. So it was in the end a grid, let's say. And by switching on the softly dimmed lights, we could see these five straight bluish or grayish beautiful lines floating very close above our heads. So these lines in that moment were the only visible light sources in the dark space. I also remember so clearly actually this impression of sinking into the ground. So it's so beautiful when you talk about this light slowly being lifted up. And I know you're researching a lot at the moment, imaginary spaces. And it was incredible that I felt that such a simple gesture actually opened something up that wasn't predictable for me. I think I would have thought about light lifting up, like me also lifting up or feeling quite airborne, but actually a very personal reaction was that I felt more grounded and spacious where I was at the moment. Could you talk a little bit to how you're working with these imaginary spaces in your in your light design in such a nuanced and, yeah, very sensitive way, actually? The construction, for example, which I've described, was a starting point for, let's call it now, a spaceship. And... This spaceship was still in a moment of waiting or it was in a waiting position for a journey into the unknown. And let's imagine we are heading off with this spaceship. So what does that mean in a real space with our possibilities, with our technology? So I loved the idea and, and this kind of image of a constant expanding and infinite airy space. 
So what we tried is to, or what we did actually was we lifted up all the light bars manually with helping hands over a period of time, very, very slowly up to 15, 20 meters, more or less. So this movement up to the sky produced a feeling of floating or flying with us. And yeah, we're sensing this atmosphere or seeing such a strong visual effect. We can create our own worlds in our minds and there are no limitations anymore. There are no boundaries. So these places are our imaginary spaces. And for me, are these are the real spaceships. Again, it becomes very playful, actually, um, thinking about spaceships being communicated by something so simple as this fluorescent bar. I'm also very interested in this idea of how light choreographs us. I think that's something that you're really communicating through your pieces that becomes very much a worlding process of being in dialogue with your surroundings and composing with them. Maybe we could move on a little bit from City Lights, a continuous gathering, which took place in 2016 and jump forward to now, 2021. How have these ideas resonated or shifted over time into your more recent projects? Exactly. Last summer, I worked uh, on Breeze with the choreographer Mila Christine for a Tanzim August Festival, which was performed on a soccer field. Uh, Breeze is a solo performance and a collective event for which I decided to build two large inflatable objects. And they are made of fabrics around 250 square meters. And they were meant to move with the performer together in this wide open space. I choose strong colors for them. So the sunlight had a surface to reflect on and also to play with. And one of these giant bubbles was magenta red and the other one was more like purple with some neon yellow stripes on it. So the colors really plopped out in this sunlight on that green plastic floor. And that looked great and was also part of this visual concept we worked on together. I also liked a lot these geometrical lines we found there. We had some bluish, white, yellow, all kind of stripes and marks. And... Um, yeah, every field is different. So the size and, and the marks you find there. So it was a big research for us. How was it with the audience being in relation to something so large? I understand a soccer field is also a really big space. So I imagine in that context, it's also working with the space that's there. But it's not often that you get to experience such a large creation in a theatrical work. How was that for audiences and also through your thinking process, creating the space and lights for this piece? I think it's not so much uh, the size of an object which affects our behavior. I think it's more about the material itself, which speaks to us, and the texture of an object which either can make me feel comfortable or super uncomfortable. I'm just thinking of, of steel, for example, or, or fabric. For Breeze, I worked with large pieces of nylon fabrics, which is also used for sail making. And these huge sheets of fabric could take on all different kinds of abstract shapes which were created not uh, by us humans. They, the shapes were made by the air and by the wind. So I think this was the beauty in it. And also this uncontrollable factor, what we had in our project. Sometimes the two inflatable bubbles became really huge, like six, seven meters high. And as they were constantly moving, they were also shifting and shaping us and also the performer actions as well. It was a very beautiful play with distance and being close to each other and also 
being with the material. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Also this idea of working with the organic world that is present, so really working with the air and seeing how they collaborate with these fabrics and these creations, I think is very, very beautiful actually, and also really resonates with your practice of creating performances in context. So being in dialogue, as you're saying in the soccer field with the, the lines, which we all know so well of delineating space and how that then moves on to the sculptures. You mentioned the lines on one of the sculptures. Could you talk a little bit about performances in context and how that works for you and through your practice? Yes, I'm inspired by working with the space, so embracing the architecture of it and also to getting to know about the history of a place can help me to make a transformation happen there. I really love to build constructions out of different materials and installations and also light installations which I then can include in the, in the locations where I'm working. And for that kind of process, I need to understand the language of, of a space, the architecture, and also find out what it can unfold for me. This idea of light installation is, is very present through the pieces I've seen that you've been collaborating on. And now, as we're talking about it through the lens of welding, I'm very curious to know more actually about how it shapes the more than in relation to it. So thinking about the human bodies that are very attracted to perhaps a light installation made of fluoro tubes, but also perhaps the moths that are attracted to it and might change their flight path. Or you were talking about the air on the soccer field and how that perhaps moves in a different way in relation to your installation? For me, a light installation is a kind of art form of sculpting artificial lights. I'm mainly working with industrial lights, which we find in urban spaces, for example, in supermarkets or parking lots. And by bringing them inside, like into a performance space or into an exhibition space, I try to give them a new identity or it automatically happens actually. So we might know the lamp and, and the light, but they're out of their context. They're kind of deplaced. That's what I play with in my works. So deplacing and transforming them. And yeah, I never thought about the moth you mentioned but that might be an interesting research too. Mm, yeah, definitely. All <laughs> the different bodies that are present, whether they be living or non-living, very interesting indeed. I wanted to pick up on your use of industrial light because in your research you speak also about non-spaces. So I would love to hear more about how that's connected to color and how that's been influenced by industrial lights in your work. And also this idea of a non-space to come back to imaginary space, because like we understand that we're never fully in a non-space. So I'm interested in how that is also linked to the imagination. Can we imagine we are nowhere? I think is a very, yeah, a very provocative proposition. The so-called non-space was um, a term which came up in a dialogue with a friend and colleague of mine, Thomas Schütt, when he looked closer at bisodium light sources yeah, and their monochromatic frequency. These lamps, these sodium lamps, are very often described as orangey lights or, or yellowish, which depends very much on your eyes and, and how you perceive the light source. Basically, what, what the lamps are doing with us is they absorb all the colors. So the question is, what's left when all our colors are gone around us? The cool thing is we can still make differences between dark and bright things, and we still see shapes and forms. 
but without colors, the objects are kind of losing their characteristics. And in the same way, this effect allows me to make a new interpretation also of something what I actually know. So a non-space is a timeless space. It's a place where we can also get lost. And I kind of like this environment a lot. Are these sodium lamps also the street lamps that you see when you're walking in parks? Or is that linked to the industrial light? Like where would we find these orange lights in our everyday life? We can find them often in parking lots and yes, also as street lamps. But yeah, it's kind of the same family, let's say. There are different kinds of oranges in our urban spaces. The sodium light really takes out the color and the other industrial orange light, you can still see like nuances of, of colors. Wow, it's amazing to think about how delicate the eyes are actually now when you're talking about the nuances between the sodium lamps and the orange street lights, I begin to think about the spaces around me in a different way, actually, which is, is very interesting. I wondered, Sandra, as part of this podcast, we're offering experiences for listeners that they can embody your research. Is there a score or a practice you could share with us so we can get a little bit closer to your very sensitive light world? Oh, yes, I would really love to invite you for an imaginary night walk through my neighborhood. We could meet in front of the supermarket here on my corner under some flickering neon lights. I would suggest around 11 p.m. That's a good time and... It would be great if it's in the middle of the week, Wednesday. So dress warm and I bring some tea and blankets for us. I also would kindly ask you to be silent and aware of your surrounding during the walk. So let's start. Let's start with walking up the tree alley. It's night time. It's quiet here. The city calmed down and I feel soft wind in my face. I see the trees gently moving in the wind. I hear our steps and I feel the small stones under my shoes. We are surrounded by soft amber park lights, which are appearing from time to time on the left and right side of our pathway. Now we are crossing the street. Above us is a huge lamp. Can you see it? They just switched it on. So we can see how it built up the light quality. It's a very different orange tone. We are getting curious now and we are stretching out our arms in order to have a look on our skin. It becomes totally pale under these lights. So where are we yet? What time is it? Let's keep on walking. The soft wind is still with us. We arrived at my favorite park. It's a very small park. It's also the end of our nice silent night walk. I spread out some blankets for us and we all sit down for a moment with a good tasty warm cup of tea. The indirect lights from the parking lots can't reach us here, but we still see our silhouettes. Everything suddenly seems to be diffuse and a bit blurred out now, and the environment is softened. Yeah, thank you for walking with me. And maybe you think back to this little excursion when you feel the soft lights on your next walking tour through the city, through your city. Wow, I have so much this impression of porousness, actually. 
as you're speaking about the diffusing of light and being in relation to the surroundings. It's a very rich proposition. I think a lot of us move through spaces quite quickly if we're on our way somewhere or returning from something and, you know, the impression of where we've just been is lingering with us. So it's a nice way to really come into the present moment, actually, in a very simple, a simple gesture of being aware of the light around you. Mm, Very rich. Thank you. Welcome. (laughs) So as part of this podcast, as you know, we're passing on the mic to somebody that has influenced your world to continue this string figure, who would you be lining up for us to speak with next? I would be very happy to pass on the mic to Mila Christina, which I mentioned before for the next Welding podcast. And I'm very looking forward to hear more about her artistic practices and projects and future plans. Wonderful. So the choreographer of Breathe, really nice continuation of our discussion. Thanks so much, Sandra, for chatting and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.